and let me get you to introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Gary Rothwell. Now, um, how are you currently employed, Mr. Rothwell? I, uh, Could you have him spell it? I apologize. No, Can you spell your name, Mr. Rothwell? R-O-T-H-W-E-L-L, -L, and Thank Gary you. is G-A-R-Y. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, how are you currently employed? I'm retired from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation and have a consulting business. Basically, I do, uh, I teach graduate school, I teach police, I do some program assessments of law enforcement agencies, and I have a private detective license and do interviews for attorneys in civil cases. How long have you been retired from GBI? Uh, I'll be seven years in July of this year. Prior to your retirement, how long did you work with the GBI? Approximately 31 years rounded up. When you were working with GBI, what was the last position that you I was special agent in charge of the GBI Division 13 office in Perry, Georgia. When you say special agent in charge, tell, tell the jury what that means. That means I was the operational commander or the actual commander of that regional office that covered 10 counties uh, in Georgia. Now, one of the counties that was covered by the Perry office, was that Irwin County? That's correct. What about Ben Hill County? Yes. Um, were you working in the Perry office in 2005 when Tara Grinstead first went missing? I was. And what was your position with the GBI at that time? I was the special agent in charge of the GBI Region 13 office there in Perry. As the special agent in charge, um, does that mean that you have other people who you supervise? That's correct. We have uh, several agents assigned to each regional office, and I oversee them and assist them in their investigations. Do those agents come to the Perry office and stay at the Perry office, or do they move in and out? Like any organization, people come and go. They either transfer, move around, get promoted, or some leave the agency. In 2005, when um, Tara was first reported missing, who was the agent who was assigned to Irwin County? That was Dominic Turner. Based on the fact that he was assigned to Irwin County and that she was reported missing from Irwin County, was he the lead agent at the time? That's correct. He was what we call the case agent, which is typically the agent with, uh, with responsibility for a county in which a crime occurs. However, was he the only agent who was working the missing persons case of Terry Grinstead? He was not. And I keep referring to it as a missing persons case, so let me kind of clarify that. Um, was this case anything other than a missing persons case during your tenure with the GBI? No, this case was classified as a 25 case in our numerical terminology, which means a, 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 an other type of investigation which covers missing persons. And this case was always considered a missing person as long as I was working on it. Why was it not considered a murder case? Because we did not know what had happened to Tara Grinstead. We did not know where she was. Why was it not considered a kidnapping case? Because we did not have evidence to, to presume that there was a kidnapping or to conclude that one had occurred. Was that a possibility? Were those things possibilities of what may have occurred? Yes. What were other possibilities? Murder was a possibility. Uh, her leaving on her own was a possibility. Uh, as we said, a, a kidnapping in which she was still alive somewhere was a possibility. I kind of want to go back and, and set the stage a little bit. Um, there may be some jurors who are too young to remember this, and then others of us have just forgotten. But in 2005, um, were there any other missing persons cases that gained sort of national attention or even international attention? <laughs> Tara's case occurred right after the Natalie Holloway missing persons case in Aruba, which was one of the first of the major investigations that are, uh, received much media coverage. Okay. Um, were there any missing persons cases during that time period where it turned out the person had left on their own accord? That there was one of much significance in Atlanta. And was there a sort of nickname for what the media called that person? Yes, this case was called the Runaway Bride. And the Runaway Bride, was that before Tara went missing or after, do you recall? That was before Tara went missing. Those cases that you've discussed, the Natalie Holloway case and the Wilbanks, it's actually Jennifer Wilbanks, but the, the Runaway Bride case, did those affect the nature of this investigation? The runaway bride case probably made it more likely that we needed to consider Tara had left on her own 
in that particular case, this was a bride that was scheduled to be married and disappeared, and there were uh, there was an investigation and much media publicity in which uh, the the bridegroom, jilted bridegroom, so to speak, was believed to be the person responsible, and he suffered a lot of uh, uh, basically slander and libel as on account of that. And it turned out she had run away and was found in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Again, though, did those affect how this case was investigated? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. So let me ask a little differently. Did the actual fact that those had occurred affect the way you investigated the case, or was there something about the nature of this case that affected this investigation? Well, we treated this case as an independent investigation. We addressed it the way that we normally would. Uh, those cases probably were the, some of the earliest ones of the, the immense media coverage, which, which was something we weren't accustomed to. And that's something that happened in our case that we were not expecting. Okay. So the, you refer to it as immense media coverage. Um, did that immense media coverage change not necessarily what you did as an investigator, but how the, the investigation went itself? Yes, it, it changed the scope of the investigation. Uh, we wound up with uh, an exponential amount of information coming in that we had to handle and address, and leads coming in that were uh, we weren't accustomed to doing that. Okay. Now you mentioned earlier that this was more, this media attention was more than what you expected. Um, does the amount of media coverage a case get um, complicate the investigation of the case? Yes. Explain that to the jury, please. Well, you. you when a case, we, we consider it going national. When a case goes national, you become the, 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 the people from all over provide information, and much of it is extraneous information. However, you have to address every lead or try to at least address every lead after you prioritize them. And it's a tremendous strain on resources, both in, in handling the investigation itself and in sorting out the information as to what's important and what's not, what's handled and what is not handled, and that sort of thing. Now, in this case in particular, in the Tara Smith case, um, were there any persons not from Osceola and not with law enforcement who were essentially inserting themselves into this case? Yes, and that, that's another aspect. In a, when, when a case gets this kind of publicity, you have a lot of self-deployment by law enforcement agencies. You have people that are volunteering. You have civilian participation, and it becomes uh, so, uh, uh, it becomes an entity into itself. And as an investigator, we're used to... to uh, coordinating an investigation and working in ourselves. And what happened in this case, if I may go on, is we had a proliferation of tip lines and message boards and, and sources that were, uh, were publicized for people to provide leads to, and that information was not necessarily coming to us in a coherent manner. Now, to be clear, are you saying that all media attention on investigation is a bad thing? No, it's not. In this situation, however, due to the fact that, as you just mentioned, there was some, I don't think you used this word, but there was some confusion about who was getting that information, um, did that create complications? Certainly, uh, you, because the, the information is not coordinated. In, in, a, in an ideal investigation, you have a focal point for leads to arrive, that the public has a phone number for a law enforcement agency that's responsible and the information is coming in and, and funneled and evaluated by people that are involved in the investigation. In this instance, we had you know, a, a terrorist center, we had tip lines, websites, what have you, where information was coming in to people that were not involved in the investigation. Such as? Who were the people it was coming to? Well, it was, it was coming to, I'm not sure, I, there were a lot of people that were getting that information. Okay, and let me kind of ask it a little differently. Did you ever learn as to whether or not someone from law enforcement, non-law enforcement person, was receiving the information from the command center um, that, where you were searching for terror? Uh, well, an example, and there was so much of this that went on, that's, uh, that's why I wasn't clear on, on, on the question. 
but we had one well-established tip line with which we were not aware early on, and that tip line was actually going to a Southern Link radio telephone uh, that was on the hip of a recovery agent who was seeking a $200,000 reward that had been publicized also. That was the type of thing that we were dealing with. If that's, if that's yes. where you... No, that, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was just, if that's the, the, the question. That particular recovery agent, um, was he forwarding all of the information and tips to you? No, he was not. Was he trying to help law enforcement find terror, or was he trying to get a reward? It's my opinion he was pursuing the award, and we, we uh, eventually he was told to cease and desist by the private detective board. Now, um, were there any other persons of note who inserted themselves into this investigation over the years that complicated the investigation? Uh, Dr. Maurice Godwin. Referred to him as Dr. Maurice Godwin. Have you ever met this person? I uh, met him once. And have you had an occasion to, in some way, investigate his credentials? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Well, without referring to my report that I wrote at the time, uh, we did an inquiry. We contacted the people involved. He claims to be a, a profiler, so we contacted people that were professional pro profilers. Kim Rosmo is one that comes to mind that said that Dr. Godwin had never been accepted into that community of profilers and that he attached himself to families and interjected himself into high-profile cases and created problems for law enforcement. So I was aware of that. I looked into his background as a police officer in North Carolina and learned that you know he had not really had any investigative experience and may have had some a small amount of drug experience and experience as a radio operator or some capacity like that, but did not have a significant background in criminal investigations to, from what I could determine. Now, again, you referred to him as Dr. Godwin. Do you know the nature of his PhD or doctor? He has a PhD in, in some criminology or some other similar discipline from the University of Liverpool in England. Now, I've not referred to you as Dr. Rothel, but do you also have a doctorate? I do. What's your doctorate? I have a doctor in public administration from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Do you typically go by Dr. Uh, only to my students at Columbus State University. Um, those things that we've discussed, on a, and obviously we just have to touching on a few of those, but did those add to the work the GBI had to do in this case in 2005? Yes, uh, if all of that contributed. Are you talking about anybody, Dr. Godwin specifically, or anybody else? The people inserting themselves in. Yes, because people had differing motives as to what they were trying to achieve. Uh, for instance, we already mentioned uh, the recovery agent seeking the, the reward money, and I'm sure there are plenty of people that were pursuing that. Uh, we had people that were seeking publicity for themselves, such as Dr. Godwin, and what we wound up doing in regard to him was we wound up chasing leads that he would pub, you know, put in the news first, and then we would have to follow behind it because we had an obligation to follow up on those leads because they were out in public. What about, do you have any psychics calling? Oh, yes, we had a tremendous number of psychics. Were there ever occasions where you were running a lead that Dr. Godwin gave you that you later found out, in fact, came from a psychic? Uh, I have to refuse, refer to the file. Were there ever times that you wound up having to deal with some of the leads that came from these psychics? Yes. Did any of that pan out? The psychic leads did not pan out, no. Did you think Dr. Godwin gave you pan out? No, it did not. Um, and, but again, were you obligated to follow it through? Yes, we were obligated to follow through because they, these were leads that we had received and not only have we received them, we have to, prior, to prioritize them and try to address them within the, within, within the resources that we have. But in, in this instance, once a, a lead was made public, we had to kind of get in front of it to make sure that we addressed it for sure. Now, in 2005, when Tara first went missing, do you know how many agents were working in the Perry office? I'm going to ask you to do math. Approximately eight sworn agents, I believe, possibly nine. Would that include yourself? That would include myself. Would that include your assistant special agent in charge? That's correct. In 2005, when Terry Grinstead went missing, was that the only case that the Perry office was working at the time? No. Um, due to the nature of this case and the amount of agents that you had, did you have to at times request assistance from either other GBI offices or from the local departments? 
Yes. And um, were you also getting tips and leads that would come in through the other local departments? Yes. And we've talked earlier about the fact that Dominic Turner was the agent in 2005 when this happened. Um, during your tenure with the GBI, did he remain the agent the entire time? No. When did Dominic Turner leave the GBI? He left the GBI in, I believe, the first week of October 2007. After Dominic Turner left the GBI, who became the lead agent? Leah Leitner. And Leah Leitner, is she with the GBI? She is not. And how long was she the lead agent on the case? Until at uh, some point in 2009, perhaps April or so. I'm not sure on the exact month. When Leah left the GBI, um, who became the lead agent on this case? Jason Shadell. And Jason Shadell, to your knowledge, was he still the lead agent at the time that Ryan and Bo Duke were arrested in this case? He was. And I said that wrong. Ryan Duke and Bo Dukes. Um, this agent Shadell, however, worked for you when you were still the SAC there? Yes, he did. And are you the one who assigned him as the lead agent on the case? I did. Despite the fact that you were never the lead agent, as a supervisor, was it your job to essentially know what your agents were doing? Yes, it was. And in this particular case, would it be fair to say that there was a lot or um, more man hours than any other case in the state of Georgia? Yes, at the time I retired, I believe it was the largest case file in the in GBI history, and it was uh, dozens of GBI agents participated and, and countless others from other agencies. At the time you retired from the GBI, were you any closer to arresting somebody on Tara's disappearance? Any closer? Than you had been on November 22nd, October 22nd, 2005. I knew we had significant evidence, but as far as tying that evidence to a specific person, we were no closer when I left than we were when we started. And that kind of leads me to my next point. Are there things that you knew back in 2005 that now that the arrest have been, has been made, makes sense in this case? Absolutely. And even though you are now retired, have you at least on some level been privy to the investigation involving Ryan Duke and Bo Duke? Yes. Um, now, let me talk to you a little bit about some of that evidence. For instance, in 2005, um, did you receive any evidence related to Tara's phone records? Yes. And um, I don't want to go through everything, but the short version of what you learned from Tara's phone records, tell us about that. The short version, it, it, from, a, from a contact standpoint or from a technical standpoint or both? From a contact standpoint. Well, she had two phones. She had a landline, which is what we call a, a typical house phone, a wired, hardwired phone, and she had a cell phone. The landline was with Altel, correction, with, yeah, with Altel. And, uh, and her cell phone was also with Altel. And we were able to establish the phone calls that she made before she disappeared, and, and, and those phone calls ceased at approximately 11 o'clock p.m. on October 22nd. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot about the phone, talk phone records I could say. I'm not sure exactly I'm what. Gonna, sorry, yeah. I apologize. I was going to ask another question, but that's what I was getting at. Okay. Was, when did her phone, her outgoing phone call cease? Yeah. Can you tell me that again? Uh, approximately 11 o'clock p.m. on October 22nd, 2005, Saturday night. Saturday night. Now, was there, were there any phone calls made to her residence on Sunday night or early, excuse me, early Sunday morning that drew the attention of law enforcement back in 2005? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury what drew your attention to that? Well, initially what drew our attention was a, uh, a readout of, of the caller ID on Tara's home phone or landline phone, which showed it approximately 9.26 a.m. on Sunday the 23rd, I believe it's 9.26, uh, on Sunday, October 23rd, there was a call from North Coast Pay with a local number. So what we did was we subpoenaed the records for that local number and found it to be a pay phone at the G&G &G Mart on Highway 129, uh, a few blocks from Tara's house. And when we looked at the time in question that the North Coast payphone had called Tara's residence, we saw 
something interesting. Basically, it was a, a Altel directory assistance number, an 800 number, and directly below, the, below that at the same time was a, a 229-555-1212 reference, which was also directory assistance, which showed us that this payphone, someone had used the payphone and had called essentially 411 Connect to try to get Tara's telephone number and then telephone her residence. Hey, for, so for my jurors who may have never lived without a cell phone, what do you mean when you say directory connect or 411? Before the advent of cell phones and everyone being able to just put a number in and a name pop up, uh, if you didn't know someone's number, you would oftentimes, if you were either using your own landline phone or you were traveling or whatever and you went to a pay phone, you could dial the area code. Well, first of all, if it was a local call, you could dial 411 and then it would give you the number after you named who you were trying to reach. It would give you the number and then it would give you the option for, for that pay phone to make the connection to the caller that you were trying to call. In other words, you were seeking a number, it would give you the number, then give you the option to actually make the connection of that call. And you could either do that by dialing 411 or oftentimes in an area code, you would dial the area code 229, for instance, and then 555-1212. That was kind of like a universal 411 if you were looking for a particular area code. Would the person making that phone call from the GNG store in Osceola, Georgia, would they have had to have used 411 or directory assistance if they already knew Tara's phone number? No, and that's what was so perplexing about the call. Prior to 2017, when Ryan Duke was arrested and interviewed by law enforcement, did you have any knowledge as to who had made that 411 call? No. Did you have any, were you any closer to figuring out who had made that 411 call prior to interviewing Ryan Duke? No. Now, um, <coughs> have you ever... Let me say, prior to 2017, when the arrest was made, had you ever heard the name Ryan Duke or Bay Dukes? That I recalled? Yes, sir. Not that I recalled. Since these arrests have been made, has it come to your attention that the information related to Bo and Ryan was uh, known by law enforcement prior to 2017? Yes. Okay. Can you Tell me about that, please. I have since learned and reviewed the file and found uh, that there was a reference to Ryan and Bo in an other agency report in 2005 that was incorporated subsequently into the GBI file. And that in July and in October of 2008, we made reference to them in two investigative summaries that were essentially from almost identical sources uh, where these names were mentioned. And that was in our own, I, I haven't explained how we have our own reports and we have other agents reports and attachments, but initially they were named in what we call an attachment. It's, an, it's a report written by another agency that's incorporated into our file. But then in 2008, we have an actual investigative summary. That's our own report written by an agent in which they are referenced in an interview with uh, two other people. Okay. Do you have any independent recollection of those reports in 2008? My, my recollection now is that we presumed, we thought that that lead had been addressed by local law enforcement as unfounded and did not follow up. Explain what you mean when you say your recollection now is that. I've thought about it, I've talked to other agents involved, and I've kind of developed a, a, a recollection that that's what occurred. On the day that Brian Duke was arrested, did you recall that those actual reports existed? No. Um, what about the attachment that was received from the Irwin County Sheriff's Office? Did you have any independent recollection of that on the day that Ryan Duke was arrested? No. 
Can you explain to this jury, and I know you've somewhat talked about it, but can you explain to this jury how it was that that, that was not caught in 2005 or 2008? I probably need to explain the GBI case reporting procedures. Okay. okay. And the GBI is an assisting agency. That means we are requested by local law enforcement to get involved in an investigation and we don't take it over. We work it with them and we work it with other law enforcement agencies that may be involved in that particular case. Our case files consist of our own reports, which are reports that where an, an agent goes out and conducts an investigative act and writes a summary. Typically they'll dictate it they may type it into the system and then that case that that report is put into the case file with attachments many times those attachments are property receipts they might be uh, consent waivers they might be transcripts of interviews or they might be what i've referred to earlier as other agency documents that means reports that we obtain from an, uh, another law enforcement agency so in this instance, I believe that the initial reference to Bo and Ryan was in a report that came from what was known as the Terra Center, and that was the, the search center that uh, when some things occurred, they created documentation that came to us sort of in mass, and it got incorporated into our file as information from the Terra Center. And that reference was missed, apparently. Okay. What about 2000? 2008 was a summary written by Special Agent Leitner in which he was interviewing uh, actually two people. They were married at the time, Andy and Janice Pop, who were responsible for the Find Terra website and one of the tip lines. And so Leah was interviewing them in order to see if there was any information that they had received from the tip line that we might have missed. So these names were mentioned in a long, I think it's about a 12-page investigative summary, uh, among other information that was uh, divulged by, by them. And I, I can't remember the length of each summary, but they were, they were married and the information was similar. But both of them had had a participation when the information had come into Irwin County Law Enforcement. As you see here today, though, is there any doubt that prior to February 2017, the names Bo Dukes and Ryan Duke were known to the GBI? They, I mean, I, I can't say they weren't known. <laughs> They're in our own report. I, rep I know I'm certain I read that report, so I can't say that. Yeah. Um, sorry, I apologize. I yeah. didn't hear you again. Um, no, I, I'm not sure. Hopefully I'm answering the question. <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of change direction a little bit and go back to the original 2005 investigation. Um, Part of the investigation in this case over the years dealt with, um, or did it deal with a glove that was located at Terry's residence? That's correct. And did you ever personally observe this glove? I, I did not observe it at the scene. Okay. Did you observe it later? I observed it later, I believe, at the crime lab. Okay. And were you... I will say, intimately involved with the crime lab at that time, trying to see what sort of information could be obtained from this glove? Yes. The glove had been found by Osceola Police Detective Bill Bars initially before we ever arrived at, at Tara's residence. It was out of place. It didn't make sense. It, it wasn't anything that was dropped by a first responder or anything like that. So it, was, it had immediate significance to us. At that time, in 2005, DNA technology, fingerprint technology, it was almost unheard of, at least as far as we knew, for any kind of DNA or fingerprints to be recovered from the glove, but we wanted to give it the best possible attempt. So I contacted Larry Peterson, who's a well-known criminalist from the uh, Atlanta child murders back in the 1970s and 80s, and he basically orchestrated a, a walkthrough with the different branches that would be involved in process, processing that glove so that they could devise a strategy to analyze it that would most likely result in, in something substantive, if it was possible at all. 
Prior to this case, do you recall ever having information about what we now refer to as touch DNA? There was no thing to our knowledge as touch DNA in 2005, 2006, and I don't believe touch DNA was available until recently. 2005 and 2000, excuse me, 2005, when this case um, was occurring, what was your knowledge as a seasoned law enforcement agent as to how DNA could be recovered from items? What sort of bodily fluids could you use to recover it? What do you, blood, semen, and possible cellular transfer, hair, uh, those were the known medium, uh, media for uh, DNA to be obtained. When you saw this glove, did it appear to have any blood on it? To my knowledge, it, I, I didn't see any blood on it. Um, Matt Frank, Stretch? Whose phone is that? Turn that over to Deputy. Matt Frank, Stretch? Yeah. I've shown these supposed accounts as well that marked the state's exhibits 28 and 29. I'm actually going to show you states 29 first and ask you if you recognize that. Well, that looks like the, the glove in question. Now, understand that you, did you take that picture? No, I did not. But is that consistent with the glove that you delivered to the GBI to be tested in this case? Yes, it is. Now, throughout the course of the investigation, did you learn what the crime lab did to actually attempt to get these different parts, fingerprints, palm prints, DNA from the glove? Yes. What did they do? Well, essentially, they assessed the likelihood of which area of the glove would have DNA evidence and which area of the glove might have latent fingerprints or latent palm prints on it. And uh, it's my understanding they cut the glove up in pieces, and so the DNA analysts had certain portions of the glove and the fingerprint analysts had other portions of the glove. I'm going to show you what's been marked at stage 28 and ask you, does that appear consistent with what your understanding is they did with the glove? Yes. I, I don't know if I've seen this picture, but I've seen a similar image before. You have seen a similar I, I image? I believe so. I okay. believe so. And that image, while you say you haven't seen that picture, the nature in which that glove is cut, is that consistent with the GBI file that you had on this case as to how the glove from Tara's yard was cut. That's consistent as to how I understood that they would would uh, cut it up to, to analyze it. I remember that they took the fingerprints and the palm part and separated them. Okay. Fingertips, excuse me. Now, again, understanding you're not um, someone who worked for the crime lab, mm. um, did you have to gain information from the crime lab in order to continue your investigation in this case? Yes. And part of that information that you obtained from the crime lab, did you learn whether or not there was any DNA obtained from the glove itself? Yes. And um, at the time, do you, did you learn whether it was one person's DNA or two people's DNA or more? Two people's DNA. Were they able to identify any of the person's DNA that was on the glove? Yes. Who was that? Tara Grinstead. Were they able at the time to identify who the other person's DNA was? No, they could just say it was male DNA. Based on that information, did the GBI swab persons in this case to see if they could match it to the unknown sample from the glove? Yes. As of your retirement from the GBI, um, could you tell this jury, maybe not exactly, but can you tell us approximately how many people were swabbed in this case? Uh, approximately 200. I believe. I can check that, but I don't believe it was about 200. Uh, and um, at the time that you retired from the GBI, had there been any matches? No. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Dr. Rothbard. All right, Mr. Fox, you may cross examine the witness. Good afternoon. You can call me Mr. Rothwell. <laughs> Agent Rothwell, I kind of like, but I guess I don't do that anymore. I'll be glad to call you Agent Rothwell. You retired about seven years ago. Uh, July, be seven years this July. July 31st. So that'd be 2012? 2012, yes. And the state started out its examination. It mentioned two cases. 
that could have impacted the Grinstead case. The first was Natalie Holloway, who went missing, I believe, uh, before Ms. Grinstead did. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that was a young lady who had been visiting Aruba on a trip and had gone allegedly missing after drinking with some local folks on the beach, correct? Something to that effect. I didn't follow it that closely. Um, and the missing bride case was a young lady who we now know got cold feet before the wedding, but she just didn't come home for the job. Right. She, she disappeared. She disappeared. Um, However, neither of those cases uh, had something that Ms. Grinstead's case had, which are scenes of a struggle in a bedroom and blood on a comfort. The description of scenes of a struggle, uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. There was a lamp that looked like it may have been overturned. The, the, the scene in Tara's house was, was ambiguous to us. We did not know if a struggle had occurred there or not. We needed more information because we had, we had, we had a situation in which many people had been in the residence that day and also several persons had been in the residence before law enforcement arrived after she was found to be missing. We also had conflicting or conflicting statements about the lamp. We had people saying that the lamp was already broken and others saying that it wasn't. So we needed more information and to conclude that a struggle had occurred there. No question there was blood on the cover. That was something that we never divulged. We don't know if it was blood or menstrual fluid. And that was one of the ambiguous aspects of that crime scene was that there was blood on the comforter, but it also could have been menstrual fluid and the crime lab could not discern one way or another. So knowing that there were children there and Tara being of age, we, we could not rule that out, but we kept it quiet because it was guilty knowledge. We, we presumed that if we ever had an offender, if we did not disclose that and the defender mentioned a struggle on the bed, then we would have evidence that that person was, was possibly responsible. Much like the phone call that had been placed on the phone? Correct. We did not disclose that. But either way, the GBI's investigation of Ms. Grinstead's case it was independent, not influenced by any other cases that had gone nationally. I believe the question about how it was influenced just meant to a mindset uh, two things. With, with the runaway bride, it, it gave credence to the possibility that this might be, gave more credence to the possibility that this might be a voluntary disappearance. Tara had some other issues in her life and had had an incident a couple of weeks before, uh, or 20 days before perhaps, uh, that would support the possibility that something like that occurred. So the runaway bride was a situation where this actually happened. Someone had essentially just disappeared on their own and it was recent. With regard to Natalie Holloway, it had to do with the publicity. It had to do with the, the nationalizing of a, a case and the exponential, as a, a term I used, increase in the amount of information with which you would have to deal. That's, that is what I understood the question about those two cases to mean. As far as how we investigated the case, we tried to investigate it like we do any other case. We just had a lot more information than we were used to dealing with. Well, that makes the case difficult. Correct. Because, it, as you said, you had the GBI is there to assist local law enforcement. Correct. We're an assisting agencies, a, a agency, but what happens many times is, you know, we will be the lead agency once we're requested to assist. Some people will say we take it over. We never take it over. We, we, we call ourselves assisting, and uh, we generally have more resources than a lot of the agencies that we uh, participate with. And in this case, you have leads and information from the public coming in directly to the GBI, potential leads coming into local law enforcement that would need to be funneled to the GBI, and then what I would call kind of all the civilian leads with the state of reference as far as message boards and 
you know, tip lines and things of that nature. That's correct. Looking to the GBI, GBI only, what was the working operational plan for when the GBI would get leads by phone or by email concerning this Grinstead's case directly to the GBI? Directly to the GBI, we have a we had a tip line in Atlanta where we had uh, operators that are staffed by the GBI administration, and we had given them questions to ask, I believe, and had a kind of a, a Terra checklist for people that called in, and they were to refer that information to us. Typically, they would fax it or 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 some uniform fashion. We also had the tip. You said strictly GBI, not Ocilla PD? Yes, sir. Okay. And then internally in the office, the office's phones are typically uh, uh, answered by, at that time, by investigative assistants, and they had a protocol themselves to, to refer that information. And again, I believe we had a form that we were using it, uh, to receive that information at least early on. And I know you all get a lot of, a lot of calls. Yeah. But were the instructions to the agents and the other people who were working for the GBI attending to these leads that they would follow up on those leads, that they just wouldn't be ignored? That's what that's the intention. Were there records generated that came in based on the forms that you were just describing? If they used the form. Uh, the, the regional office, maybe I'm, maybe I'm understanding your question now, the, the, rate, the regional office is staffed by, I believe at that time, eight or nine agents and two support personnel, and it conducts all types of business, administrative and, what, and otherwise. So calls come in all the time. Uh, I can't say that, you know, that every call that ever came in was funneled exactly the way it should have, should have occurred with regard to Terrace case. I can't. But I do know that we had a lot of information going all over the place and not coming to us at all. Okay. And the, the information that was coming in from all over the place and not coming to you at all, was that more from what I would call the civilian tip lines and message boards and that sort of thing? Or did that include local law enforcement as well? Not sure I follow that question. I, I, I think I asked if that was clear as mud. Let me try this one. Uh, what were the instructions the GBI gave local law enforcement, Osceola PD, other areas around there, in order to make sure that the tips that came to them would make their way to the GBI? With regard to Osceola PD in Irwin County, we had the, I know we had the, the tip form and a, and a format for them to transmit to us information they came, that they got specifically about Tara. Osceola Police Department and the Irwin County Sheriff's Department were, they, they occupied the same building and they used the same dispatcher. So that was how we addressed that. With regard to the outside law enforcement agencies, we were just relying on them to provide us the information as it came in. We didn't have a form, format to do that, that's something that we learned in this case that you probably need to do. Sure. Were the case agents instructed to ever contact or follow up with local law enforcement agencies just to make sure they were being diligent about giving tips, leads, and other information to the GBI so that your office could then process and follow up? Were agents directed to go to the local agencies and tell them how to? No, just inquiring and making sure, doing due diligence, if you will, reminding the agencies to make sure that they're sending the information. Well, every, every county had a county agent, but I don't know that we have a formal structure for them to tell them that. I just, I, you know, it's, once again, there were some lessons learned from this case because of the way that it unfolded, that, you know, I teach classes about lessons we've learned, you know, well, and that would be, that would be one, the, one of the biggest problems we had was getting control of the information period. I mean, from other law enforcement agencies and from the civilian tip lines, from the, from the websites, everything. That was one of the, the, the problems we have was getting control of that information early on. You would agree that the GBI had better control of the information it was collecting directly than it did from local law enforcement or from other non-law enforcement sources? I, mean, I would think so because we have autonomy over our people, but Things don't always work out perfectly. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
You said you had numerous people calling in leads and things pursuing the reward plan. That's correct. That's my opinion. We had a, you know, we had a, a publicized reward. Uh, some of it, I'm not so sure if it actually ever existed. But. And, and I think we just made testimony that there was something about on the posters, hundred, maybe hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that. I think the number that was most mentioned was two hundred thousand. And I think you said you also had people who were getting involved, at least in your opinion, perhaps for personal fame. I believe so, yes. And it went so far that there were psychics involved in the case, trying to give information. Not the GBI. Uh, well, any, any, any publicized case, a publicized case has uh, its, its number of psychics, but this one had a lot. And we typically did not act on psychic information beyond determining what the information was and that it came from a psychic and discerning that it wasn't actionable. Uh, in fact, there were occasions in 2007 where, well, for example, one, do you recall Mr. Kenya King passing along information in uh, April 2007 that he knew who had killed Tara Faye Grinstead and wrote a body in the murder with? I would have to look at the report. Well, do you recall at all there being any false confessions, people who had no kind of case whatsoever but saying, hey, I did it? Yes, that did happen. I'm sure that complicated the investigation. Well, you have to address it. Right. As you said, you have to address every lead and follow the information that comes in. We try to address every lead. You have to prioritize them in, uh, with the resources that you're giving. So, so you try to address all of them. Uh, that's one of the, the things I stress, but sometimes things slip through. How are leads prioritized? You evaluate them. They're, it's kind of a subjective process, but usually the case agent or someone in that capacity, if the leads are coming in, it's, it's, it's hard to describe a, a, uh, a fluid investigation like this because we give our agents a lot of autonomy as they're out in the field and that they get some, de develop something. It's, it's not a corporate structure where they have to come back and get permission to go out to do another interview and then come back and get permission. They will run with that information as they obtain it and, and move on to an outcome to resolve something. Uh, other times leads come in and they are, you know, they're, they're disparate and we need to assign someone to address them and then they go out and follow up on it and then they have the same latitude to follow through with it then. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, 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 it just depends on the circumstances as to how they're addressed. But you had said uh, in acknowledge that you had received the Irwin County report from 2005 where there had been a report that Mr. Duke and Mr. Dukes had been involved in uh, disappearance of Ms. Grinstead. What I'm familiar with is a reference in a longer report in the information that was obtained from the Terra Center and that this report had been authored by uh, an Irwin County deputy and it was included in a, in a longer report. And the longer report that it was included in was the nine page, uh, well, y'all call it exhibits. It, that's kind of a report of investigation yeah. where the agent uh, makes a summary of their findings, discussions with people, and then it, for example, the interviews recorded, that's then called an attachment to that exhibit. If you want me to explain, would you like me to explain what an exhibit is? Sure. Okay. An exhibit is something that is prepared when, it, when a case is prepared for court. It's organized so that, it ha a, that the items can be located. So things are given what they call an exhibit number. And that might be an investigative summary by an agent discussing what they did on an investigative act, and then it would include whatever attachments that might be associated with it, whether it be, a, as I said earlier, an evidence receipt, a, a, uh, a waiver certificate, a transcript, or what have you, and all that together would be called an exhibit, and it would be given an exhibit number. In a working case file prior to court, we don't have exhibit numbers on items. They are just individual standalone investigative acts with the attachments included to the report. In this case, that's something like 1,992 exhibits. 
I haven't counted them, but I'll I can check. It's grown yeah, no, it was much of that occurred while I was around. Absolutely. Uh, the 2008 matter you referred to, that was an exhibit prepared by Agent Leah Leitner following her discussion with Janice Hall. I'm not sure which order it is between Janice and Andy Palk. They were both interviewed, uh, one in July and one in um, October of 2008. Have you reviewed those reports or summaries? I have, I have read those reports briefly recently and, and earlier just when we were trying to determine why we missed this. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I probably read it back then because I imagine my initials are on the report of having read it. So that's why I cannot say that I wasn't aware of this at some point. And you familiar, well, and you agree, and I'll ask it this way, agree that in Agent Leitner's report, it specifically states that Ms. Paul felt law enforcement should look Ryan Duke and Bo Dukes, uh, given the statements he had made or they had made earlier to Garland Lott. I'll have to read it, but I, I don't doubt that it said something to that effect. Okay. Would it be beneficial? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would it help to refresh your recollection to see that report? Sure. No, oh, it's. No, I, I can see a highlight. Oh, I can't. I said you, you said you could scan. I could scan it, and I can't figure out how to do it. What's the exhibit number, Mr. It is sixteen twelve. Thank you. She also felt that law enforcement should look at the Duke boys. She thinks their names are Ryan Duke and Bo Duke. Yeah. Okay. From, I've read that. Okay. Very good. Very good. That information is on page three of the interview that occurred back on October 7th, 2008. Yes. I, and I'm not sure if it's that one or the other interview where there's reference that it was addressed by Irwin County, I'm not sure. So I, it really technically could then appear in both of those. Yeah, yeah, I believe that I believe those names appear in two two GBI interviews. And I believe you said the GBI presumed it had been followed up on by Irwin County, uh, but that the information actually had never been there. That's correct, and I wish I'd, I'd rather not say the term presume. I, see, I just think we thought that. And, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah. I'm trying to be pejorative. I might have said presume, but I, I, you know, we thought that. Okay. And it's something we should have followed up, but we, we, we didn't. Whose responsibility would it have been to follow up on that? Issue? Mine. Yours ultimately. Mine. Case agents never made any representation that they had followed up. That is something that I, I'm not sure I follow your question. Well, I'm saying nobody ever represented to you that they had followed up on this information. You like the schedule? No, I don't think that an agent followed up or represented that they did. I think that we thought that it had been addressed by local law enforcement and we should have followed up and we did not. And that is my responsibility. for my descriptive terms are not always understandable. It, it could have gone either way. We didn't have enough information to know whether a struggle occurred there or not. We did not have an obvious sign of a, a forcible entry. 
but we had we had the the lamp obviously and some other issues and the blood that could suggest that a struggle occurred but then we had competing all uh, explanations that maybe that was already there so we couldn't commit it that's what i mean by ambiguous so i want to clarify the the scene what you saw there at Tara grinstead's house on october 24th 2005 could that have been consistent with a struggle when she was being murdered yes it could could it also have been consistent with about 10 teenage girls being in and out of that house on Saturday getting ready for a beauty pageant? Yes, and people being in the house before law enforcement arrived trying to find her. And on October 24, 2005, did you have um, any specific knowledge about what had happened to Tara Grinstead? No. Do you work the case as if she has been murdered or if she has been kidnapped? Yes, we have a kind of a, I guess it's a cliche, uh, you, you hope for the wor best and presume the worst. And so we pursued it as, as if a criminal act had occurred. Now, defense counsel asked you about what he termed false confessions, and I want to follow up a little bit about that. Um, have you ever, throughout the course of this trial, excuse me, throughout the course of this case, did you ever have persons claim responsibility for the murder of Tara Grinstead? Yes. Okay. Um, did that happen once or more than once? More than once. Was there follow-up done on each of those occasions to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, yes. In each of those occasions where someone confessed to having killed Tara Grinstead, was there evidence to disprove their statement? To where they confessed to having killed her, was there evidence to disprove? Yes. Okay. Can you give us any examples of that? Well, typically what we would do is interview the person, uh, get their their timeline, their alibi, and, and the main way that we uh, disproved a lot of it, at least, uh, let me rephrase that. We swabbed a lot of people for buckle swabs to compare with the evidence on that glove. That did not necessarily exclude them from being a third party involved in it but it did give us an indication that maybe what they were telling us was not true. Okay. Were there any other ways that you were able to learn that the people who had confessed were in fact not telling the truth? Well, oftentimes they would say that they were lying or joking or that they weren't serious when they made those statements. Okay. What about what you referenced earlier as guilty knowledge? Oh, the... I didn't explain the concept of guilty knowledge. I think I made reference to it. And guilty knowledge is, is information that only the offender would know. So that's, that is information that law enforcement investigators often keep out of the public because they don't want it to become public knowledge because they want to be able to evaluate on a defendant's or, or, or a potential offenders statements and measured against evidence that we know is there that they don't know we know about. So consequently it is it is a way if someone's telling you that they were, did something in a in a residence and the layout of that residence has never been uh, made public and they're giving you a completely different description of the residence than what it actually is that's an indicator that there maybe they're not telling the truth. And that would be, say, guilty knowledge. Many times it's just the, 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 the location itself. In this particular case, what was the largest um, or the biggest piece of guilty knowledge that was held back that only law enforcement knew about? Well, there was, actually, there was two, actually. Uh, one was the fact that we had Tara's DNA on the glove. Uh, we never disclosed that. We always said that we just had DNA on the glove, and when we did disclose anything about it about three years in we said that it was male DNA we never disclosed that Tara's DNA was on the glove because we wanted some if someone came to us and had a, a bogus uh, explanation for that glove being there we would be able to address that by asking them how Tara's DNA got on it what was the other piece of guilty knowledge that was held back? The phone call from the pay phone at 926 or whatever it was Sunday morning and from November 20, excuse me, October 24th, 2005, until the day you retired from the GBI, had any person interviewed in this case, um, able, were they ever able to give the GBI or any other agency information about that phone call from the payphone? I, I'm not sure I followed that. Please. 
during the course of the investigation up until the point you retired, any suspect or any person of interest ever have knowledge about that pay phone call that was made in the early morning hours of October 23rd? No. No. Thank you.